لو بس ما رحمة الرحيم So, Bismarahmarahim and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everyone, inshallah, today we're actually doing two things. Number one, uh, of course, we're doing the, the tafsir for this A. We're first going to do the English part of it, even though we did it, but we're going to do it again. And we, uh, alhamdulillah, are supposed to be celebrating that we uh, completed the seventh volume in tafsir al Qurtubi. And we're right now starting the eighth volume in Tafsir al-Qurtubi. So remember with Tafsir al-Qurtubi, I mean, right there, this is, I guess we have to say this over and over again. This is the book that we're using, Al-Jama' Li-Ahkam Al-Qur'an. And with Al-Jama' Li-Ahkam Al-Qur'an, of course, and it's more dedicated and focused on the different ayat that are in legislature. And the author, the main author is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Abi Bakr al-Qurtubi. This ta actually means this is the year that he had died in. So he died 671 Hijriya. Right, so that was talking about al-Qurtubi right from the name al-Qurtubi tells you that he was in Qurtuba in Al-Andalus, in what is called Spain today. And certainly the time, he does actually have his own, uh, well, he does actually have a couple people that were called, and some of them were related to him, Al-Muhaddath Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah, um, uh, Abu, sorry, Al Abbas Al Qurtubi. Now that's related to him, but you have a lot of scholars that are named based on, let's say, they're famous based on the place that they had lived in, Qurtuba. So this was very common, and you would find a lot of scholars that are named Al Qurtubi, and there is, if we could actually go to it, there is. A book called Mu'jam A'lam al Mu'allifin. Maybe we could show you that one really quick. And then you could see, even though it's it's actually a huge book, Mu'jam A'lam al Mu'allifin. And this book, Rida Kahala. So, Umar Rida Kahala. And what he did in that book, he did an outstanding job. So, he would get all um, the different scholars. It's actually more than this, it's actually in 15 volumes. This is the volumes that I, these are the volumes that I was used to. Anyhow, so what he did in, in almost uh, 15 volumes, in the 15 volumes in where he would combine all the, the different uh, scholars that, how, that were authors and that had written something. And then what he would do, um, he would, let's see right there and where perhaps we can see some of those, one of that book. Let's see, we're going to see, what was the name right there? Al-Qurtubi, Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ahmad Al-Qurtubi. So here we go, we're going to go uh, anywhere. Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ahmad, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to go all the way down, and we're going to get Muhammad ibn Ahmad, okay? Muhammad ibn Ahmad, go all the way up, okay? And we're going to be finding Muhammad ibn Ahmad. Okay, Muhammad ibn Ahmad. Here we go. It's either going to be this one or that one. Let's see, right there. And he said Muhammad ibn al Ahrash. Let's go right there. Okay. Muhammad ibn Ahmad. Okay, so this one's a different one. Let's go back to it. And Muhammad ibn Ahmad. And we've got. Okay, just need some searching right there. Okay, this needs some searching, but anyhow, when we're looking at um, this book, what it does is that it basically helps us find the scholars and get some information about them. And then at the end, right there and where it would give you, for example, the information on how to find those scholars. Inshallah, we'll find them and we'll inshallah find um 
find the uh, more information about Al Qurtubi himself, inshallah. Anyhow, so to look at Al Qurtubi himself, of course, the life and certainly uh, the area that he was living in, it was a place of ilm. It was a place of ilm. And uh, the one that did tahqiq is Dr. Abdullah ibn Abdul Muhsin at Turkey. And he wasn't from Turkey, though. You, and you had a number of different scholars that uh, that uh, joined him. We talked about it wasn't just them and they would have a team, but that's a different story. Okay, so that's the area that we're doing right now. وَكَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَنَّ النَّفْسَ بِالنَّفْسَ That we had, when you will see the word katabna. Katabna means written, but this is not to say written, literally written. So this is not to write something, but this is actually to say, Say that they they were ordained. They were uh, de they were asked to commit to something. So katabna alayhim upon them that a soul is for a soul. So this is an nafsu bin nafs, or that that an nafsa bin nafs. Um, that every soul is basically when assaulted. When assault is to happen, then the the other soul would be basically the way to compensate for that soul. والعين بالعين, in an eye, for an eye. We know that that's actually a famous thing, even, even in, um, in I believe, the Hammurabi laws. والعين بالعين, an eye for an eye, a nose for a nose, and an ear for an ear, a tooth for a tooth, and والجروح قصاص, in the different assaults, basically would take a compensation therein, depending on what the assault was. فَمَنْ تَصَدَّقَ بِهِ فَهُوَ كَفَّارَةُ اللَّهِ Whoever would, we're talking about sadaqah here, in other words, gave up and seek for an expiation, but at the end did not necessarily seek a compensation for the assault, and in that situation, that would be the expiation on their behalf. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ And those that would not rule by the rule of the Lord Almighty are the transgressors. Now, when you look at that one, remember right there, and we're just before that, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Whoever does not rule by the rule of the Lord Almighty, those are the disbelievers. Now it ended it, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ So pretty much, let's kind of highlight and really see what we're looking at. So the first one is, if you don't rule by the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are considered a kafir. The second one, if you don't rule by the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are considered a zalim, a transgressor right there. Now, the, the later one you're going to see in where it's going to tell us, وَمَن لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ It's giving me a different one. Whoever doesn't rule by the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they are fasiqun, then they are basically um, going away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed. In other words, they're taking away the shield of protection and therefore that would basically make them susceptible to the different contaminations that would be out there, contamination to the soul, contamination to the different assaults probably, let's say, decay within the society, and the list goes on and on. So when you look at this one, so are they really kafir? Are they zalim? Are they fasiq? This this isn't a contradiction. So we're not here looking at contradictions. We're actually looking at it from different angles in where if a person were to rule other than through the rule of the Lord Almighty, what that what that implication would look like. And of course, what if we're talking about الكافرون, that would actually speak about it from the implication, from the angle in where they would be distant and certainly away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They had denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by leaving the words of the, the Lord Almighty to be the ruling uh, point, to be the ruling center. So that's one area. Then there were then there kafirun be and we talked about what Tawus thought. Well, this is kufr duna kufr. Is it considered a sin or is it considered that no, they had actually left the religion entirely? We talked about this this piece of it yesterday, so we won't go in details. Now, the second one, fa'ulaika humu zalimun, would mean that they are transgressors. When you're a zalim, that actually means that there's a limit that you had actually trespassed. When you say a limit that you had trespassed, it basically means 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was letting you within these boundaries. Therefore, even when we're speaking about uh, criminal laws, they're actually supposed to be laws to apply and not something that is not obligatory. They're obligatory things to be within. They're obligatory laws to apply and not considered as well something marginal they're not marginal they're actually supposed to be the areas to protect the border what border the border of justice and when you look at the word volume this basically would be opposite to adil okay so the opposite of kafir is muslim but the opposite of volume is adil volume actually means oppressor Injust. Adil would be the person that is just. So when you're looking at that, if somebody is to rule by not the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then therefore they're they're basically tyrants. They're committing injustice. So if we were to put it within the context, it is basically to say that just by the idea of not applying the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether we're speaking about criminal law or whether we're speaking about the details in how and what we apply in laws, even if we're speaking about laws on a personal level, at the end, it's a form of transgression that will actually have uh, injustice actually be prevalent within the society. In other words, if we're letting the people that had committed the assaults get away with their assault, the implication is this will start affecting the society. This will bring about the harm at a larger scale, and this may become an endless effect on the society. Let's go for the other one, in where Allah subhanahu wa says again, Whoever doesn't rule by the rule of the Lord Almighty, then they are the ones that are fasiqun. And we talked about al-fasiq before. We said al-fasiq uh, in al-fisq itself is basically to remove the peel off the fruit. Once you remove the peel off the fruit, it makes it more susceptible and certainly it would decay faster, it would rot in faster, etc. So in other words, that that peel was supposed to be a shield to preserve it for longer times. When you say fa'ulaika humul fasiqun, it would really tell us that when we're speaking about applying Sharia laws, whether we're speaking about uh, spiritual or let's call it ritual laws, or whether we're speaking about laws that pertain to eating, drinking, or whether we're speaking about laws that relate to criminal laws. All of them are supposed to be laws to protect the society, to protect the individual, to protect the universe, to protect the the whole world from getting into the decay. So this is important in where when you're speaking about the individual himself or herself going in, away from let's say the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the implication is not only going to be on the individual, but will also affect the society as well. So when you look at al-fasiqun, in where within this context, so when we're speaking about not applying the laws in relationship to, of course, uh, supporting those that are perhaps, one, assaulted, or supporting those that are abused by not standing up for them, and definitely uh, giving that equal uh, that equal punishment or at least that equal pain in order for for others to learn the lesson and abstain from this, then what you're going to be ending up in, ending up having within the society is people taking the law in their own hands. And then of course, what that what that's going to mean is that a society is going to start attacking one another and what you'll be ending up is al-fisq and a decaying society, a society that is decaying inside out and a society that is decaying is basically a society that is dying. And that's what we actually see within our um, 
within our times, of course, in where we're seeing more and more, uh, of course, of that decay becoming prevalent within our societies in where harm and attacking one another, because whether we're speaking about the big countries that are committing the assault, supporting the uh, the oppressors and et cetera, and what that will lead into. And then they start wondering, well, why is it? Um, why is it that we're getting more of, let's say, different kinds of attacks on all of that? Well, once you support the oppressor, then you're actually part of the oppression. You are supporting injustice. So expect others to retaliate without you realizing or even expecting. Okay, let's continue right there. Katabna alayhim fiha Let's say right there in where when we speak about so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had basically um, laid out a very important rule that we would basically consider as uh, the prelude, as the, the basis when we're speaking about criminal law, when we're speaking about dealing, of course, within the society, within uh, the citizens, etc., is that there's supposed to be a form of equality. Um, everybody is supposed to be equal. Their rights are supposed to be, uh, their rights are supposed to be protected, preserved in the same way. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was laying out, katabna alayhim. So it was prescribed upon them. But wait a minute, who's upon who? Upon who was this written? So you could say that the context was actually talking about the Yahud. So certainly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prescribed historically upon the Yahud, and this was was this also the Sharia that we're supposed to be applying as well? We'll talk about that. So the Yahud themselves, it was actually prescribed in the Torah that that the whole idea of equality, that it's life for a life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, that that was supposed to be the basis of justice. But did they actually uh, abide by that? The answer is no. What they didn't want to abide by is really the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why you had the Jews of Bani Nadir want the Prophet Sallam to really rule in their favor because they considered themselves the upper class. In other words, basically, let um, Bani Quraida just accept that they are the upper class. Therefore, they don't necessarily have to pay a life for a life or even abide by the text. So that's why you would say that in the person from Bani Nadir, his dia, in other words, his blood money, was in case where someone from Bani Nadir would commit an assault and kill some from someone from Bani Nadir, that they would consider that no, the value of our life is bigger because we actually bring in more money. Therefore, for our value is more, is higher. So in a situation where you would assault somebody from our tribe, on our tribe, then they're in, in that situation, the compensation was going to be bigger. And certainly you could see that the society that is considering that a rich person is of a higher value than a poor person. And certainly you could say, you know, I, you know, this is a little off topic, but there's this movie uh, that right now is, I didn't watch the movie, of course, the movie is actually <laughs> recently out there, but it was actually talking about, and it's really going viral, it's talking about this Indian Hindu guy that goes to Saudi Arabia, and this man um, gets into the wrong hands. He's going out of the airport waiting for this kefil or this person that's supposed to be, I guess, um, giving him the sponsorship. And then someone else pretends to be his sponsor, and then he takes him, uh, puts him in, I guess, in this uh, pickup truck, puts him at the back of the pickup truck, and then basically takes him in this really remote place and ends up wanting him to work in, um, in being a shepherd. And then 
basically doesn't give them food, enough food, enough water. And the the movie is just talking about the suffering that he went through. Well, the movie is actually based off on a true story uh, that actually went viral a couple years back. And they decided, I guess the Indians decided to make a movie out of it. But here's one thing. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, Not because, um, well, we're speaking about Saudis or Al uh, Khalij in general, not because they are Muslim and not because they are Arab that we're supposed to support them. I must admit, racism is disgusting there, it is far beyond disgusting. And subhanAllah, not to treat whether the person is a Hindu or whether the person is Muslim or whether the, whatever the religion that they come from, racism is not acceptable. To deal and treat someone as if they were their slaves, believe it or not, when they would even deal with women as if they were Kanye Cubines and actually rape the women, thinking that they're actually Kanye Cubines. And this is disgusting because... You're seeing a whole society living, this is real, they're living the whole idea thinking that these people are slaves and abusing them. They would pay them $280 or $200 a month and they don't give them, you know, you're talking about $200 a month where, you know, that's really the price of probably one Monday uh, dinner that they're inviting, you know, a day or I don't know, they're going for their coffee or whatever. And that's how they would just lavishly pay it in a day, but they're willing to pay this much money for somebody that is working for a whole month, working like maids. They would give them these you know, these rooms where they're not even decent, bathrooms that are not even decent, clothes that are not, and they would clothe them in an attire in where it is separate from everybody else's attire. They would call it like the work or the maid's clothes in order to really separate them from other people. It is disgusting, I must say. And uh, certainly, if you're not um, being fair and equal to the people when they're around you working and you're not equal to them when they are harmed and it's so sad i mean i um i had actually interviewed a couple women um you know just just talking to them and just interviewing them and how are you uh, treated and all of that and they would tell me that they would expect them to use you know the word madam all the time and that they're supposed to put their eyes down and not raise them that they're uh, many times slapped if they're probably behind uh, not doing their work fast enough and all of that it's just disgusting it's disgusting to actually see, you know, such, uh, such abuse. And definitely, this does not resemble Islam, it does not resemble Islam. And I said, I told you the story in where I was sitting with, with this, with this group in where um, it was supposed to be a professor in Hadith, in Hadith, Wallahi Azim, in Qatar University. And they had invited me to this really prestigious restaurant um, in Qatar, in Qatar, and um, and the people were, of course, the, the the ones that were serving. They were bringing in the food and all of that. But Subhanallah, you know, they don't even look at them. And I said. And well, the lady was asking me, what did you like about Qatar and what did you not like? I said, what I liked was, yes, it it was in some areas um, more advanced than I had expected. And she said, what did you not like? I said, racism and racism and racism. She said, what racism are you talking about? I said, what racism am I talking about? Look at you. The lady came. I didn't even notice. Wallahi al-azim. The lady came in and put you some food but because she's sri lankan or indonesian 
or Filipino, you don't even look at their faces to say something as small as thank you. You don't even give eye contact. And she said, they rape our boys. I'm like, they rape your boys? Well, they must not be boys. They must not be men even. They rape our men. I said, they rape your men? What do you mean they rape your men? These I mean, most of the Filipino and Sri Lankan are actually short in in body. And they would be raping your men? And said, yeah, they take our clothes. I said, wait a minute, let, let's, let's talk about this for a bit. Did you take, how many maids do you have? And she said, six. I said, you have six. Fair enough. How much do you pay each? And she said, $250. Six I said, maids? Six maids, oh $250. I said, $250. And do they wear the same clothes that you're wearing? She said, no, we only give them one particular attire to wear. That way they could recognize that it's time to work. I said, what time does she wake up? She said, 5 a.m. I said, what time does she sleep? She said, 11 at night. I said, you think that's fair? How You pay her $250 from 5 a.m. She wakes up till 11 at night. That's that's more than a full time shift. That's that's that, what do we consider that? That's more than forty hours. That's what are you serious? And she said, "Well, they actually." I said, "Wait a minute. Is the passport with you or with her?" She said, "No, the passport is with me." I said, "Why is the passport with you?" And she said, "That way, whenever she wants to leave, she could only take the permission from me." I said, "Don't you think that that's slavery?" that you're giving her to work and she won't have the right to leave the job unless you approve her to leave with all this type of work that you're giving her. And she said, well, they actually kidnap our boys. I said, kidnap your boy? Where are they taking your boys? Are they just a little, uh, and she's talking about men. And she said, they eat our food. They take our food and said, do you actually give her food? And she said, well, after we're done, they'll eat. Uh, we'll give them some food, but they'll actually eat our food. I said, I don't say that they're looking like overweight to actually eat your food. They actually would look malnutritioned to actually claim that they're eating your food. And sorry, but you're the one that's obese. I didn't care that she was inviting me, to be honest. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. I was talking in tears. I was talking in tears. And she said, yeah, they're actually even stealing our money and all of that. I said, stealing your money. Maybe you should pay them better. Maybe you should give them better food. Maybe you should at least treat them with dignity. Treat them with honor. And you will see that these people would want to stay without you taking their passport. They'll want to stay because they're finding dignity. They're finding a good job. They're finding their humanity in something that they're giving service to. And subhanAllah, you know, I, I couldn't actually, I couldn't eat it, not anything during that moment because and this is a, what a professor in Hadith, a professor in Hadith. I said, it's a shame that a professor in Hadith could not understand and learn the main adab of what Hadith teaches, that you have to respect people, that you have to honor people for their life. You have to give them that honor. And subhanAllah, to be honest, that was the most disgusting thing I had ever, ever thought I had I would ever see, whether it was in Kuwait, whether it was in Qatar, whether it was in Saudi Arabia, and they're living in such despicable racism, like this is normal. Like this is normal. Like yes, this is this is how these people are treated. This is this is absolutely normal, and they're 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 passing it on to their children. Even the children. We've got Saudis here, in where there were some, you know, salah garments that were hung, 
And I was telling the girls, I said, hey, girls, it's Aisha time. Why don't you pray? They were holding on their tablets and iPhones and and they were said they said no uh we're not gonna pray here I said why not and she said there's uh we don't have any uh prayer clothes and I said sir uh sure it's right there it's it's hung up there and she said no we're not gonna wear that I said why not and she said that's for the maids they're disgusting just imagine teaching even the children that the maids are disgusting you don't even wear their clothes. Don't even touch them because you're considered upper class and they're lower class. Subhanallah, the Prophet ﷺ was teaching us a very important dua to make. And that dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka fi'al al-khayrat wa tark al-munkarat wa hubb al -masakin. Ya Allah, I ask you to let me in and give me the honor to do al khaira to do what is good, and abstain from evil, and love al masakin There is no way that you're going to be humble enough to do what is good and to abstain from what is wrong unless you live at close relations with al masakin Well, not just close relations, but loving al-masakin, hubb al-masakin. You have to love them. That's the doorway to getting your tazkiyah. You know, Sister Umayya asked me a few days ago and asking, you know, um, whether there was supposed to be a teacher or uh, to teach us tazkiyah and all of that. And I said, there's no better teacher than al-masakin. The teachers themselves, they'll teach you some of the things about, I would say, the theory. The theory in learning akhlaq, the theory in learning tazkiyah, the theory in learning Islam. But the true practice, the true embracement really comes when you learn it through the masakin. Because the masakin, they're living it because they don't have dunya to run after. They don't have a dunya to run after. They only have al akhirah to run after. So you will see that dunya is not their main concern because they, they, can't, they, they can't afford it. Anyways, they're living at a minimum, food at a minimum. Their house, you would go where they're lucky if they have a bathroom or they're probably doing their business in a tin, just a, an empty pickle tin. You would see their home, you know, very simple and where, yes, their beds, no beds. It's just these mattresses. And most of the times the mattresses are so, so thin that it's like you're sleeping on a carpet. Or perhaps on the floor. The water, most of the times you would see the water sometimes would discon they get uh, disconnected and who knows what they're going to be getting. You, the fridge. That's most of it is probably, hey, leftovers, this is what we have for today. And most of the times there's no meat in it, no chicken. It's usually uh, you're either going to have pasta or rice, you know, something that, hey, poor people would usually eat. Maybe lentils, you might have that. And that, what does that teach us? Well, that teaches us how to connect with al-akhirah. How to connect with al-akhirah, that you cannot connect with al-akhirah when you are constantly hanging out around those that are considering themselves as upper class. True Tezkiya comes when you have this humble relationship. It's not just any type of relationship. It's a love relationship. A love relationship, we're not talking about romantic here, but we're talking about that you tr truly live a relationship where you blend with them. You love them because you recognize you were capable of finding that these people are living sincerity. These people have what the upper class, rich class does not have. These people are transparent with themselves. These people, they are really simple where they'll give you whatever they have whatever they have they learned 
with their simple life, they learned that there was something more valuable than the money itself, the value of family, the value of our, I guess, our commitment, the value of principle, the value of all of those things in, in uh, our relationship is even more valuable than the money. And subhanAllah, you know, you when you deal with these uh, masakeen, you come to, I guess, a different realization, a different taste, a different, you know, that's why when you look at even what's happening in Gaza, it really taught us a very important lesson. It taught us that it's so easy to give lectures on on tazkiyah, it's so easy to give lectures on sabr, so easy to give lectures on jihad and whatever whatever topic you wanted to talk about. It's so easy to talk about it. But to really live it, to really embrace it, to really connect to it, that's the hard thing. That's the that's that commitment to really, really live it at close levels. That's going to be rare. And when you, what the people of Gaza had taught us, and we're, Ya Allah, radina, Ya Allah, we're content. You know, usually you would see people when they're going through trauma, they're basically talking about uh, how, uh, how, of course, uh, pain let them lose their belief in God and they lost faith in Allah because they went through pain and because they went through trauma and all of that. And they would go into that. But that's not what you would see um, when it came to seeing the people of Gaza. No, they will say, Ya Allah, radeen, radeen, radeen. Take, take more if you need. Radeen. Now this is true Iman. This is true Iman. When you're seeing people be committed to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even during al-makrah, this is it. And when they're in a state of hardship or in a state of ease, whether in their state of ease or during a state of al-manshat and al-makrah, when they're feeling, hey, I'm feeling, I guess, somehow uh, energetic, I'm feeling ready for for salah or da'wah or, you know, to do different activities, etc. But there's, that's so easy when you're in a state of al-manshat. Everybody is right now becoming Muslim. Yeah, hey, we could join along. It kind of feels, hey, you've got a support group. But al-makrah is when you see the other way, when you see most people are losing their hope in victory, leaving Islam. This girl is leaving hijab and the other one is leaving Islam. And we're hearing more and more stories of people leaving Islam and more and more stories of people deciding, you know, becomes, especially in 2012, you had, it was like a wave of people coming to Islam. And in 2016, it was a wave of people leaving Islam. Right. It was it was it was it yeah to, to uh 2012, a wave of people coming into Islam. And then in 2014 or 2016, was it? It was a wave of people leaving Islam and leaving hijab. It was it comes away. Those people that would basically enter Islam with a wave and leave Islam with a wave, you would see those are basically shaken in their iman. Shaken in their iman. Their iman is not stable. It's basically ala harf. It's at the edge. They're ready to leave, ready to stay. Why? Because they let others think for them. Because they let others think for them. When they let others think for them, Shafi'i said, Wala khayra fi mutaqalliban There's no good in a person that is constantly, I guess, living at a place of instability. Whenever the wind would come over or a massive winds would come by, they would basically get what? They would basically get basically. Whew, yeah, it's like, a, it's like a dead leaf that's falling from the tree and it's the a, wind just blows yeah. it. Wind blows it and it's off the tree and down. It's like, wait a minute. You you didn't even hang on to Islam. 
you changed. Yes, today she's Muslim. Two years later, she decided to leave Islam. Three years later, decided to join uh, Christianity. Four years later, decided to do piercing. F six years later, perhaps coming back to Islam later on and keep on changing. That's telling you that this is this is an, an impulsive behavior in where it's emotions that bring about the judgment and bring about their perception and not necessarily... Isn't that one of the signs of the Day of Judgment? It is. يُصْبِحُ الرَّجُلُ مُؤْمِنًا وَيُمْسِي كَافِرًا The Prophet ﷺ said that there's going to come a time where people would wake up Muslim and sleep kafir and sleep as a kafir and wake up as a Muslim. It definitely is. It definitely is. We're seeing right now in where people changing really within an instant. Within an instant. What happened? Hey, it was just a simple fitna. Just a simple fitna. Nothing big. It's not even the jail. It's a simple fitna. Perhaps the loss of a, a job even. Or perhaps she didn't get the grades that she had made dua for. Or perhaps um, she wanted to get married to this person that she had a crush on and he didn't come. And therefore, she made the dua that she would get married to this guy. Well, he didn't come. He got married to her friend instead of her. So therefore, she basically left Islam. Really? You left Islam for a guy? Look at that. It's subhanAllah. Anyhow, let's continue with this one. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was decreeing it. It was a decree from the time of uh, the Torah, from the time of Bani Israel, that a nafsa bin nafs, that nafs and people are equal in their life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically demonstrated that in where we're not just talking about the nafs, we're also talking about the pieces and the parts. So here this is talking about a comprehensive in a, a comprehensive way, and this is talking about in a partition way, and where even if we're talking about the whole life, it's basically equal to other people's lives. And same thing. When we're talking about the eyes, yeah, the eye for an eye, because what is considered of, of course, part of your eye is basically as much as it is valuable and it's precious to you, other people's eyes are precious to them too. So once you recognize that to, uh, to respect other people's precious areas, you'll recognize that as much as it is precious to you, as your eye is precious to you, your life is precious to you, that you would basically do the golden rule, which basically is love for your neighbors, what you would love for yourself. The end, based on that, in where considering that people are equal in their life and equal in their body, and that it is all supposed to be preserved by the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is something that we have to consider is sacred, sacred for all mankind. And same thing when we're speaking about the details in where Islam had actually come in order to let Banu Quraidha, um, of course, uh, rule based on what the Torah itself was ruling which is that equality, and therefore, Banu Nadir, what they had actually done was against the Torah. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, um, uh, and of course, we're, when we're speaking about um, equality, when we're speaking about, well, what do we, uh, do we really have sharia uh, that basically teaches the same, uh, the same idea that teaches the same principle. We're going to talk about that in detail. Let's see right there. Al Qurtubi actually said that there were 30 different issues or 30 different categories that he wanted to discuss in regards to this ayah. We might not complete all of them, but we'll speak about at least the majority of them. Let's see then. Now, here's one thing. Is that is the when we're speaking about Sharia to Man Qablana, let's look at this one. I'm gonna jump up to here. In where Shafi'i had actually said, This is a khabar on Shar'i Man Qablana, wa Sharu Man Qablana, Laysa Sharan Lana. 
what is this whole story right here? And what does this even mean? So here's one thing. Is the legislature that comes from the past legislatures, if we're talking about, let's say, we're talking about um, any legislature, whether we're speaking about ritual or whether transaction, marriage, or criminal law, does that sharia that we know that was applied in the nations before. So whether we're speaking about during the time of Prophet Suleiman, Prophet Musa, the list goes on and on. <clears throat> Do we take that as an inspiration to apply the same and consider that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had considered it as a sharia before, then therefore we should adopt that sharia. What does it what is sharia? Sharia is legislature. Are we supposed to adopt that as a legislature, in other words, as a default ruling, and that Islam, only if we are to find anything in Islam, uh, abrogate that sharia, that we would take whatever Islam had abrogated. But is it that the sharia before us, is it something? Thing that is supposed to be the default ruling and therefore whatever Islam had come to abrogate then we would take the latest of what was abrogated or is it that no all the sharia that is before us is not necessarily a sharia that we would embrace in any way and therefore even to take the inspiration we don't even take it and here we're not talking about a sharia that we don't even know whether um whether it was approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. We're not here talking about something that we don't know of. Let's give an example. In where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that uh, uh, that uh, Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, all right, you remember that, that man that basically had his shepherds go into someone else's fields and eat from those fields. And then, of course, um, his son, well, he rules first, but then his son ruled um, in, in the opposite ruling of what the father ruled. In other words, Suleiman ruled other than what Dawood alayhi salam had ruled. And then um, basically, uh, basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically in that situation taught Prophet Dawood alayhi salam that one, he's supposed to hear both sides, two, in where um you know uh in where it was supposed to be basically in equality, etc. Anyhow, so do we actually consider the rulings that were judged in what we know are rules in Part, in parts of the Sharia of different prophets, do we take that as a Sharia that we have to adopt or not? That's the question. Let's give another example, maybe a clear example. When we look at Prophet Musa, السلام, remember when he goes off to the city of Median, and then he meets these two girls there. Uh, the two girls were trying to fetch water, but of course they were standing on a side and they didn't actually join with the rest of the group because there were a lot of men there. So they basically wait till they're finished, but it was already too late because they had already closed the lid, which was a huge rock over um, over that well. So the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, being a man, he basically removes that rock in order for them to get water. He stands on the side, he's really tired, really um, exhausted. And that's when the girls would get the water, ask them about, well, why are you getting the water and not like a man doing this job? And they basically said, well, our father is basically an older man and here we are doing this job. So they go to their father and that the girls would tell their father that there is this man that basically helped us. And one of the girls suggested, why don't you hire him? Because he's Hawaii and he's Amin. He's strong and he's also I mean, trustworthy because she saw that he was in term in he wasn't intermingling with the girls and trying to chat with them and flirt with them. She saw that what he resembled was a man of honesty, a man of integrity. 
So she suggested to her father that here's a man of integrity. Here's a man of honesty. Here's a man of power. He is definitely a person to hire. So then the girl goes and while well, her father tells her to go get him, he goes and well, she goes and gets him. And then the father suggests that, okay, in order for you to pay the mahar for my daughter, you would basically have to work themenya hijaj. You would have to work for eight years, basically to pay off the mahar. Pay off, pay off the mahar. In other words, here we go. Can the mahar actually be a job? Can the mahar be service? Can we take that and say, well, here it is. We've got an inspiration where the Quran approved that the mahar can be service. The mahar can be uh, a job that a man would hold or perhaps that uh, the girls, for example, you know, just different things in terms of probably uh, sharia in terms of all the different details or certain details. Can we use that as an inspiration and say, well, we've got the sharia that from the sharia before us and it was approved, Quran did not say, that this piece of it was abrogated and this Quran was silent about it. Therefore, we should adopt and embrace that sharia in where the Quran regards it or Islam or the hadith would regard it as acceptable. Therefore, we would have to take the inspiration for it. Now, that's a huge debate between scholars. This Sharu man qablana, is it sharia, is it a sharia, or is it a legislature that we would adopt and embrace or not? It's a huge debate between scholars. And the reason for that, why don't you just consider this one, in where there are four major resources slash references that Muslims would go back to in order to basically discuss legislature. Let's actually look at that right there. Okay, we're going to go right there in where we're going to call it, okay, Masadar al-Tashriya, and we're going to basically um, have you see it. And that way, let's see if we can actually, let's look at this one. I hope they gave us something that is decent. In where he got watch it. So at this one. Okay, here we go. So the first one is Al Kitab. The first one that we would go back to is basically a Quran. Why? Because the Prophet Sallam had basically laid out the paradigm in where said, well, I had left you with two things. You would not be astray if you were to hold on to them. What are they? He said, What's well, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the sunnah of his prophet. The sunnah of his prophet, meaning the tradition of the, Pro the Prophet Sallam was teaching us, okay? So when you're looking at these resources, you're looking at the resources themselves in where the hadith, the Quran, were basically telling us that we have to go back to these resources in order to understand the parameters um, of where and what resources are considered as uh, resources that we would depend on in our Islam. Okay, the second one is basically al-ijma'ah. Al-ijma'ah is basically consensus between scholars in where the Prophet ﷺ, um, where Allah subhanahu wa said, وَمَا يُشَاقِقُ رَسُولٌ بَعْدِ مَا يَتْبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبَعَ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Whoever goes away from what the Prophet ﷺ had come with after they had seen Il Huda guidance and they would follow other than the path of the believers, then in that situation they would be basically Nuwallihimatawala. They would be basically, of course, following the authority of whatever authority that they, they regarded as their place of authority. And at the end Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would basically um decree them to going to hellfire. So right there the word if they were to follow other than the path of the believers that this is actually an indication in the Quran that going to um, the path of the believers and taking al-ijma' and the consensus is actually a resource that even the Quran was telling us to go back to. Now here's the other one, which is al-qiyas. That's the fourth one. Although, yes, you had Ibrahim and Nazam, you had um, Ibn Hazm, basically not accept al-qiyas. What is al-qiyas? Al-qiyas is basically an analogy. But al-qiyas... <clears throat> 
is not based on the wisdom behind something, behind the ruling, but it's actually based on what is called the la'illa. What is the difference between the wisdom and the la'illa? La'illa is basically the reason, the analogy, the reason behind a particular ruling, the reason why khamar or alcohol is considered haram was really because of the intoxication. In other words, because it leads the person to losing their mind, they're losing their ability to basically process and all those different areas of losing the mind, etc. So therefore, anything that gets into the same result into intoxication is basically going to take the same ruling. Okay, so it wasn't haram because it was some kind of a, a juice and therefore you're getting too much sugar um, and therefore it can lead to the no 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 this is a illa in where it's completely different than the wisdom the wisdom in where yes because it's effect on kidney and liver and all these different that's one side of wisdom but that's not the reason why so if you were to have something that might affect the kidneys or might actually affect the liver, et cetera, we're not going to say it's haram because alcohol is haram, because that's a wisdom. But the reason why alcohol was haram, because of the main, the, the main connection and the, because of the main effect of intoxication. All right. In where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, was also telling us, there's something called al-ashbah wal-nadha'ar. What is it, ashbah wa nadha'ar? Al ashbah wa nadha'ar are basically looking into, let's actually use and write that word because this is a main one. Let's write that one in where we're talking about al ashbah wa nadha'ar. What is al ashbah and al nadha'ar? So, al ashbah are basically the things that are similar. We would consider the things that are similar, taking the same things or taking the same ruling, the same implication. We would look at things that are identical, things that are similar, basically taking the same ruling at the end. Why? Because even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling us, to take certain things in where certain, of course, ibra, certain themes, certain research in where Look, looking deep and studying those things in order for us to recognize the analogy in relationship to those things. Now, here's one thing. Now, all the different things that we had done and talked about before, let's look at this right there, in where we talked about Al-Quran, no one, no Muslim would say whether the Quran is outdated just by saying the Quran is outdated that gets the person out of the fold of Islam. So if we're talking about the resources that they would agree on, which is Al-Quran, Al-Sunnah, Al-Ijma, those basically were a consensus between scholars, including Al-Qiyas. Um, you know, just two didn't agree, but yet for the other scholars, there's something that some scholars actually had differences of opinions on. And those areas are things like Al-Istihsan, in where we talked about that before, in where perhaps we have a tax, but then, of course, the situation looking um, basically at the, the circumstances, just like Umar ibn al-Khattab, he saw the circumstances that they were going through a famine, but even though the tax says that if you were to steal, your hand or your arm is going to get amputated, but Umar ibn al-Khattab saw that there was a famine right there, and that the whole idea, the legal maxims, and the whole idea of Islam was in order to protect and preserve people's lives. These people were actually in uh, their property, certainly. But of course, these people were stealing for food. Therefore, he basically had halt and put a halt onto the application of stealing, or at least the assault of stealing and uh, the the punishment for stealing, because people were right now living in a situation of necessity. So here's istihsan right there, in where basically by looking at the circumstances, considering considering certain situations as basically requiring deeper 
let's say, deeper scrutiny in making sure that we're applying the legal maxims based on the lens of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or based on the whole idea of why Sharia was even was even uh was even decreed. It was to protect people and preserve people's lives, preserve people's health, preserve people's wealth, and the list goes on and on. But once of course their life is at stake, then that's a different situation. Al-Mursala. And I'm not going to go in each and every single one because what we're, and of course, Sadda Dara is probably one, the, the main key one, which is closing the means that lead to evil. And Qawl al-Sahabi, do we actually consider the words of a Sahabi, do we consider those as references, their quotes? Are they references to say, well, here's Umar ibn al-Khattab, this is what he said, therefore, this is what Islam says. Is this something that we would consider? And are their words considered opinions? Or are their words considered as places and, and basically a legislation? And it's the same thing when we're talking about Sharruman Qablana. That's the key point that we're talking about right now. In where the um the uh, the previous legislations we're talking about previous meaning the times that had preceded us the times in where we're speaking about Bani Israel we're talking about during the time of Prophet Isa alayhi salam all of that the Hanafi the Hanbali and some Malikis um and of course uh, and even some Shafi'is as well, they considered that, yes, we would get that inspiration from the previous nations or previous legislations, and we would actually consider it as an inspiration because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَى اللَّهِ فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقَتَدِهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, those are the people that were guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then by their guidance, you should take as an example and embrace their guidance. Now, here's one thing. Not all scholars necessarily agreed that this is supposed to be a reference that we would go back to. Some scholars, they considered that no, not necessarily that we would take it as even if we're talking about number one is that the resource we could not guarantee exactly what the circumstances looked like so that was i guess the the opposing view in where they said we can't guarantee the circumstances in how these laws were applied that's number one number two is that when we're speaking about the law Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us that that today i had perfected your religion and accepted islam or decreed islam as the religion that you would embrace he didn't tell us to embrace Shariatuman Qablana. So they considered that here the ayah is saying today I had perfected Islam for you. So to somehow get an inspiration from different legislatures, it's not something that Islam was telling us to go back to. So of course you could see the huge debate between scholars right there. And that's the key point in where do we actually apply this whole idea of equality in the same way? Do we apply it even in Islam and say, yes, we've got right there, here's our evidence. And therefore, um, if we're speaking about um, basically non-Muslims, me, we're talking about women, we're talking about, you know, uh, different. Are there any, let's say, exceptions in Islam? How do we actually apply? Do we take the inspiration from this area and apply the same, or do we not apply the same? What really happens? Let's see. In where Abu Hanifa had basically considered that this ayah was a key ayah in where even if we're speaking about an assault between a Muslim and a Dhimmi, that they're both nafs compared to a nafs. It's a life for a life. And therefore, Abu Hanifa regarded, here's my evidence, and therefore, it's a life for a life. And therefore, the whole default ruling 
and the basis is it's basically equality and therefore any assault whether it's a dhimmi assaulting a muslim or a muslim assaulting on a dhimmi that they're basically equal in the eyes of the law well is that really something that all scholars agreed on well let's see there is a hadith um, where Ali ibn Abi Talib was asked, is there anything that the Prophet ﷺ had basically given you khasak, in where, you know, anointed you with something in where other people probably didn't have? And he said, no, there's nothing except what is in this. So he brings out uh, some kind of a, uh, I guess, something that was scribed. It's called, they would call it a book, but it's not a book and where, you know, a bunch of papers. It's more like a, a small written uh, piece in where it was actually kept within what he would hang his sword on. And he uh, read what was written in it. That the believers, their lives are equal. So when we're speaking about the word dima is basically blood, but this is a metaphor. Their lives are evil, are equal. Their their lives are basically here in where no one is better than another person. And their one hand, one unity, that is, this is a metaphor, unity on all those that are other than them. وَلَا يُقْتَلُ مُسْلِمٌ مُسْلِمٌ بِكَافِرٌ And no Muslim is killed for the life of a kafir. And وَلَا ذُو عَهْدٍ فِي عَهْدِهِ And the Muslim is never to be killed in, of course, a replacement or even a person that is in a situation where they're, I guess, uh, in a coming in a visa or pledging, etc., or having some form of an agreement. But here's one thing in where let's look at this number one, in where it was narrated by Sunan Abi Dawood, and you could see la yuqtal Muslimun bi kafir, just the part that no Muslim is to be killed for the life of a kafir is actually narrated in Bukhari, at least that portion of it. You could see that that actually brought in a debate. Do we actually deal in complete equality? Well, wait a minute. If this was narrated by Bukhari, why would Abu Hanifa actually not embrace that? Now, keep in mind, Al-Bukhari or Abu Hanifa didn't embrace a lot of ahadith in Al-Bukhari because Il, uh, Il Abu Hanifa actually died 150 year hijra. Al-Bukhari wasn't even born then. Al-Bukhari died 256 hijra. That's almost that's almost a that's a whole uh, that, that's a whole century after all right you're looking at you know the whole century so to actually think that uh, abu hanifa rejected al hadith in al bukhari because he didn't believe in al bukhari well he didn't even have those resources al abu hanifa would definitely have wished that there were these um these um references available he wouldn't have needed to do all those analogies and all those scrutinies in that way because he was living in al iraq and al iraq was a, pr a place where you had many religions you had many clans you had many cults you had many ways in where it was a place of turbulences it al iraq was a place that you could really not necessarily trust everybody because you had people coming in pretending to be Muslim really just to bring about uh, any disunity and a division within the Ummah. So let's see, if we were to have this hadith right there and we were to have this ayah right there, how do we understand, is there a contradiction? How do we understand all of that? So let's see. In where, um, of course, uh, you had some scholars that said, well, this basically, this ayah was really here laying out in order to respond and refute to the Yahud when they had considered that there was, because they were 12 tribes, that there was one tribe that was considered somehow, I guess, 
holy or somehow at a higher rank compared to another tribe, that they're all supposed to be equal. And therefore, um, this was actually in response to something that they were doing. In other words, the whole context of what surrounds the application of this ayah, um, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling us that that's what was written in their scripture, we can't necessarily embrace that entirely. So we shouldn't be talking about equality? No, 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 wait, we're, we're, we're not done yet, okay? So Shafi'i basically said, well, this is khabar an shar'i man qablina. This, right, qablana, sorry. And where this is more of an informative clause in this informative clause of telling us about the legislature that had preceded us and not necessarily that just because it was informing us of a, of a legislature that they were asked to comply by, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to apply the same thing and consider it that that's what makes justice. But what really defines justice? Why shouldn't it be equality? How do we actually consider all of that? And if we're talking about justice, who defines justice? Isn't that fair to actually go back to the whole idea that it's an eye for an eye, ear for an ear, and shouldn't we embrace this whole idea of People's lives are supposed to be equal. People's rights and the preservation of people's rights and people's properties and people's ahrad and people's chastities and families and in their lives and even the part of their lives, their body is supposed to be equal. How do we understand all of this? So how is it that we would see this hadith actually contradicting an ayah. How do we understand that? Now, that's to be, inshallah, tomorrow, all right? Even though we still didn't get there, right? Um, but inshallah, we'll answer those questions tomorrow, inshallah, in some detail, okay? Because this would actually need a lot of focus. So hopefully, inshallah, we won't get carried away tomorrow and answer those questions and see what, of course, Al-Qurtabi would answer in relationship to this ayah. Out, other than this question, in these set of questions, any questions on what we did for that? I'm doing like the 1001 nights, remember that? And where I would tell you the story, and then right when it gets spicy, I would stop just to make sure I don't get killed. <laughs> right? Isn't that how the story goes? So you can unmute yourselves if you would like and ask the questions. I guess everybody wants me to turn off the uh turn off the recording first. Okay. We'll stop.